oh, if I'd been born half a century sooner, I wouldn't have missed out on all the excitement. Back in the 1950s and 60s, states would build hundreds of miles of new freeway every single year. And then that slowly fizzled over time. And in Western America, no new interstate freeways have been constructed since 1980. That's when the last new one opened, I-84. I mean, sure, they've done widenings and upgrades, but no new interstate freeways. And think how much the West has grown since 1980. I mean, it, surely we justify a few new ones. So today in this video, I want to get to the bottom of why is that the case? What's the real reason why Western America just hasn't been building them? In this century, America has become a nation on wheels. The West has not seen a new interstate built in nearly four decades. And that's gradually becoming a big problem. So this may seem a little unthinkable if you live out east where interstates are plentiful, but Phoenix and Las Vegas are not connected by an interstate highway. Nearly seven million people with their cars and all the freight and semi-trucks to come serve them traveling across some of America's roughest terrain on these outdated country highways with stop signs and with no bridges to cross. How did we get here? The vast majority of the interstate system was considered complete in the 1990s. Let's rewind the clock back to a time before a single mile of interstate highway existed in the United States. Back to World War I, when America's military realized railroads simply weren't going to cut it. See, the Army had this convoy of trucks, and they tried to take them coast to coast from Washington, D.C. to the West Coast. The convoy made it to Nebraska without much trouble. The Rocky Mountains started to be a bit of a pain. Mud near the Great Salt Lake in Utah was so horrible, the Army nearly gave up and turned around. <laughs> and perhaps it was fate. One of the soldiers, a 28-year-old named Dwight, would never forget that convoy he was on. Because if you fast forward 37 years... President of the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower. And when Congress slid a $25 billion authorization bill across his desk to build 41,000 miles of freeways, President Eisenhower had no problem signing that into law. So the interstate system that was established in the 50s and 60s really laid out the network that was needed at the time, and there was funding for it at the time. State highway engineers were flush with cash to hand over to roadway contractors, and construction pretty much started immediately in some places. Well, what is it, John? It's from the highway commissioner. We have found it necessary to acquire your property for right-of-way. You mean the freeway is going to come through our place? I'm not going to have these highway people come in here and tear out our good trees and turn the house into rubble. No! These are my trees. And when those bulldozers come, they'll find me sitting right here in this chair. The interstate system wound up costing about $114 billion. And once the big money ran out, a few cities were kind of left out. And of course, among them, Las Vegas and Phoenix. See, back when the interstates were originally built, Phoenix and Las Vegas weren't connected together, but they have both exploded in size. Phoenix is now the 13th largest metropolitan area in the United States. So what are these two sprouting metropolitan centers doing to cope with not having an interstate highway link? Sandra Rosenberg, S-O-N-D-R-A. Well, I got a chance to sit down with an expert to find out about it. There was a need for a Colorado River crossing. The place where you would cross the Colorado River was the Hoover Dam. What a terrible place to cross the Colorado River. Due to the congestion, um, sitting in traffic while every single vehicle went over the Hoover Dam. A little narrow one lane road that would cross over the Hoover Dam at 15 miles per hour. Big semi trucks carrying all sorts of stuff between the two cities having to cross over a single fragile place. And then September 11th happened. Due to security concerns, uh, commercial vehicles were banned, big trucks, 18-wheelers, were banned from crossing the Hoover Dam. And that caused a 75 to 100-mile detour for trucks. And so the Bureau of Reclamation started a plan to build that. And that bridge changed everything. It was kind of cool, actually. They started building from each side, and, and luckily it actually worked and met in the middle. We have good engineers, right? An infrastructure project so grand in its majesty, 
it kind of rivals the Hoover Dam itself. A gigantic arched bridge to carry traffic around the dam on a freeway bypass. It took about 10 years to get it done, but when it's done now, you can just sail by the Hoover Dam. There's also this pathway which lets you walk out onto the bridge, separated from traffic with this nice wall. And you can check out panoramic views of Lake Mead and the Hoover Dam. The walkway itself really is quite the tourist attraction of its own now. This was just on a weekday and look how crowded it is. Imagine what it's like on a holiday weekend. So with the shiny new $240 million freeway bridge open, planners, politicians, and public average Joes like you and me got thinking, could this actually be the first part of a new interstate to finally link Phoenix and Las Vegas together? That bridge was planned um, with or without I-11, but it, it helped have that conversation is um, on, you know, what are the, what's the commercial traffic uh, between these two states. And this kicked off the Intermountain West Corridor Study. A look at the needs of Phoenix to Las Vegas traffic, but also looking at the entire West from Canada to Mexico. I-11 was first thought about from uh, a group of citizens and transportation experts, and there really is a big lack of north-south connections, um, particularly in, in Arizona and Nevada. So it's many, many community meetings to identify what are the criteria that we should be evaluating, looking at kind of broad corridors. So we, we tried to really steer the conversation from, I want it here, I want it there, to what are the factors? Avoid sensitive areas, minimize impact to small communities. Get people talking about you know the purpose of the corridor, the need of the corridor, and what factors should we consider when we start putting lines on a map. So this is where US 93 travels farther to the south. It passes through the town of Boulder City, Nevada. And this town also had horrible traffic because once people had crossed the Hoover Dam, they ended up funneling down this town's main street. In fact, you even had to make a left turn to stay on US 93. Oh, when the bridge opens, trucks are coming back. So with the detour around the, the dam, they were also detoured around uh, Boulder City. So now that the trucks are coming back, could the existing facility actually handle all the truck traffic and the passenger vehicles? It's sort of like that movie Cars, except the opposite problem. Too much traffic was funneling down Main Street to the point where the locals couldn't even go to local shops. It was time to consider the next big infrastructure project. Bypassing all the through traffic, and especially the big rig trucks, around the city. So the Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada found some money, and the Department of Transportation put contractors to work grading and paving and building bridges, all on a freeway quality bypass, which would link the Hoover Dam Bypass Bridge to an existing urban freeway in the Vegas suburbs. So a few years ago, I drove all the way from Vegas out here to the desert to take a selfie of myself standing next to some bushes in the desert because that's where the Boulder City Bypass was going to get built. Yeah, I number myself among the transportation nerds. Anyway, there's a temptation when you look at the desert like this to say, well, why did the Boulder City Bypass have to get built right there? You could have built it here or here or there because the desert is all the same. Except 50 years of engineering knowledge have taught us that highways cause impact. To make sure you're not inadvertently um, creating a, an environmental impact that may need to be mitigated later on if you don't do it with the project. Because trying to fix it later is far more expensive. And those impacts are documented in something called an environmental impact statement, which is actually required by federal law. You go back to 1970, President Nixon signed the National Environmental Policy Act. Well, oftentimes people think of NEPA as environmental protection, which is actually a little bit of a misnomer. It is the, the Policy Act, not a Protection Act, and it's really a process to make sure you're documenting potential impacts. It's not just um, environmental, it's, it's social as well. So looking at what populations, what people are being affected. And on a big project like this, even though the state pays for most of it, there's still some federal money. Those impacts have to be documented. Think about a big project going on in your city. Type it into Google and add the letters E-I-S. You'll find environmental impact statements on just about everything built. A new airport, there's an E-I-S. New light rail line, E-I-S. New big urban boulevards and freeways and freeway interchange rebuilds, 
all have EISs. So there's, there's a lot of talk about, you know, the NEPA process is just bureaucracy, it's just paperwork, but it actually, um, it's more collaborative. It helps us factor in information we may not have otherwise looked at if we were just looking at where is it easiest to build. I feel it helps us build better, better projects, more thoughtful projects. So with bottlenecks gone at the Hoover Dam and at Boulder City, the new Interstate 11 is kind of a fire hose pointed squarely at the southern end of Las Vegas flooding the already busy existing urban and suburban road networks that have plenty of commuters already with even more through traffic. And I was curious, how does a city, which is already built up, deal with a new interstate coming through town? We used to be very good at projecting traffic. Um, there's some disruptive technologies that make that a lot tougher now. And the reason that's important for Las Vegas is figuring out how to get through Las Vegas um, it, it depends on where it goes next. It was the late 1950s and engineers were excited to get these freeways built. And so as they pushed the interstates up to the edges of the city, they needed to find land to build it on. And, well, they're not going to put it on expensive land, right? So it used to be we'd just build a freeway and, and communities would be impacted. A lot of times it's where is the land cheapest, where is it easiest to build. 100% of the time, 100% of the time it seems like, the cheap land was always the neighborhoods where working class, socioeconomically disadvantaged, ethnic minorities, they lived. And it was their neighborhoods in city after city across America that were sliced right down the middle, block after block of houses being bulldozed because their houses were the cheapest. Let me tell two stories. One is Syracuse, New York. The other is South Pasadena, California. In both cases, engineers plan to cut interstate highways through existing neighborhoods. I-81 in Syracuse and the 710 freeway in South Pasadena. One of these cities had cheap land and was home to poor African-American renters. The other, you tell me which interstate got built and which one never did. Come down to a neighborhood like this that was divided by a freeway and tell me you wouldn't want to live next to this giant viaduct. It feels like you're crossing a chasm, like it's a no man's land, like the, the DMZ. And that eerie sound of the cars on the viaduct above, listen. And so part of that mountain of paperwork, NEPA and other federal rules since then, have made sure that as engineers and planners put new highways through cities, that they kind of spread the pain around and not just stick it all on one group of people. So now because of, of the National Environmental Policy Act, we have to look at all of these things. Who's being impacted? Uh, what's being impacted? Can you avoid, minimize, or mitigate those impacts? Especially if it's something as significant as an interstate route, so that's going to be there a long time. We, we better get this right. I suppose it's easy to paint 1950s engineers as villains, like Christopher Lloyd's character in the 1990 film Roger Rabbit, whose diabolical plan was to build a freeway. Only a tune could come up with an idea that crazy. I don't think there was any malice intent there. I think we just didn't understand the impacts of what we were doing. And again, that's part of why I think NEPA was was generated. You know, there's, there's things we did probably 10, 15 years ago that we wouldn't do today. So we continue to learn, we continue to adapt, we continue to try and make the best decisions we can with the information we have available to us today, um, involve as many people as we can in the process. Everybody has valuable input. You need to make sure you're, you're involving as many voices as possible so you have as much information as you can to make the best decisions we can at the time. So Sandra, thank you very much. Thank you. All of these new freeways, the Hoover Dam Bridge, Boulder City Bypass, existing freeway in Henderson, Nevada, they all now get to wear the official badge Interstate 11, which means technically Nevada has broken Western America's 40-year losing streak of no new interstates. We all want the roads, but we want them on somebody else's place, not ours. We all want the benefits and the progress and the safety and the convenience, but we want them without having to disturb our own setup. Well, if we want all these things, the highway has to go someplace.